Have you ever gotten an email from someone that was supposed to say something like, it's great to hear from you, except instead of it's, it said, it is. What? How does that even, it's just text, right? Like, how do you get text wrong? Text is not a new problem. You're right, it's not a new problem. In fact, this apostrophe problem has its roots in the automated telegraph systems of the 1960s. But the good news is, 50 years later, we're getting closer to fixing it. Welcome to the binary tree. Electric telegraph systems have always used digital schemes for transmitting text. That's because an analog signal, like a telephone voice connection, wouldn't carry well enough over the wires of the day. But as we saw last time, a digital signal can be much clearer. Telegraph companies used several encoding schemes. Morse code is probably the most closely associated with the telegraph, but there were also binary codes codes which assigned each letter a series of ones and zeros to represent it. As telegraph systems became automated, teletext machines used exclusively binary encodings because while Morse can be easier for humans to use, machines work really well with binary. In 1963, AT&T began to use a new standard called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Here it is. Think of this as the periodic table of ASCII. Each character is represented by seven bits. So capital I is 1001001, T is 1110100, S is 1110011, and look, there's the apostrophe. Except that's not the same apostrophe. The apostrophe is the same character as a single close quote, one that looks like a nine. And there's supposed to be another one that looks like a six, a single open quote. Those are called curly quotes. But here, there's just the one single quote and the one double quote. These are called straight quotes. And they're the only ones here because that's what typewriters had. And typewriters had as few characters as they could get away with to save on manufacturing costs. Also, there was limited space in ASCII. They wanted to put the whole thing into seven bits, which means there were only 128 characters available. If the space was limited to 128 characters, what's with all this junk over here? Those are called control characters. See, in addition to the printable characters, these teletype systems needed to tell each other other things like when they were beginning and ending their transmissions. Most of these we don't use anymore, like start of header, but we still use horizontal tab and backspace and escape and several others. This is also why you have a control key on your keyboard. Originally, pressing control would just zero out the top two bits. So to signal a backspace, you'd press control H. On the command line and in most places on the Mac, that still works today. Okay, fast forward, computers have become a big deal and text is still being stored in ASCII because that's what everyone knows. IBM has this other encoding called EBCDIC, but it doesn't have the same kind of traction and plus no one knows how to pronounce EBCDIC. They're trying to use ASCII all over the world, but a lot of countries are having trouble because where's the enye? Or the U with an umlaut? Or the O with a slash through it? How can you have Broderbund without the O with a slash through it? And without Broderbund, there's no shuffle puck. And who wants to live in a world without shuffle puck? Ah, but remember, ASCII uses seven bits. Computers like to use eight bits at a time. That's called a byte. And it's the fundamental grouping of bits that computers like to work with. So we've got this extra eighth bit hanging around, which means we can double the size of our periodic table. If the 8th bit is 0, that's our old ASCII table. If the 8th bit is 1, that's a character from our new table. Now we can have twice as many characters. Unfortunately, no one can agree on which characters should go in this extra space. Cyrillic language speakers want Cyrillic characters, and Arabic speakers want Arabic characters, and Thai speakers want Thai characters. For the most part, each of these groups had to work independently, and files created with Cyrillic software would make characters that couldn't be read by Arabic software, because they reused the same parts of the table. But they could all use basic Latin characters because nobody changed the ASCII half of the table because everyone loves America. It took an international standards organization to finally make some sense of it all. Actually, THE International Standards Organization, ISO, which is actually called the International Organization for Standardization, but they abbreviated ISO because it has three official languages, English, French, and Russian, and the name abbreviates to ISO in none of them. So ISO came up with a standard called ISO 88591, also known as Latin one, because who can remember all those numbers? It completely covers the character sets of 29 languages and mostly covers several more. It has the enye, it has the O with a slash through it, it even has the letter thorn, currently used only in Icelandic. The thing is, squeezing all this into eight bits of table, it's just not enough. 
There are a lot of characters in the world, way more than 256, and it would be nice to have an unambiguous way to refer to any one of them without worrying about what country your file is going to be opened in, right? Well, in 1987, Joe Becker of Xerox and Lee Collins and Mark Davis from Apple tried to create exactly that. It started with a table that used 16 bits, room for over 65,000 characters, which they figured would be enough to cover all the world's languages. That project was called Unicode. The first version of it was published in 1991. By 1996, they had dropped the 16-bit restriction and increased the number of spots in the table to over 1 million, making room for not only today's languages, but ancient languages and chess pieces and those funny characters at the bottom of checks. All of that is in there with room to spare. And you know what else is in there? You got it. Curly quotes. So if your friend used a curly apostrophe, then she's probably using Unicode. So how does Unicode encode a curly apostrophe? Well, actually, Unicode doesn't encode anything by itself. Unicode's not quite an encoding. It does give every character a number, a code point, but they're not necessarily the numbers that end up in the text file. Remember how the creators of Unicode started with 16 bits and later decided that wasn't enough? Well, it now takes 32 bits, that's four bytes, to completely specify a code point. If you just wrote down the code point numbers one after another, you'd be able to encode your text as data, but it would take four times as many bits as ASCII, because each character is four times as long, and that's no good. Luckily, the early 90s also gave us a great encoding for Unicode code points. It's called UTF-8. The most important part of UTF-8's design is that the first 128 code points of Unicode, the ones with numbers so small they fit in seven bits, those characters are encoded with a single byte, same length as ASCII characters. And what are those first 128 code points of Unicode? They're the same as the first 128 characters of all these character sets so far. They're ASCII. That means that a file containing only good old ASCII characters looks exactly the same in the ASCII encoding from 50 years ago as it does in today's UTF-8. So that means I and T and S are still the same because they're ASCII characters. But how do we represent the apostrophe in UTF-8? Well, we look up its code point in the Unicode table, which is 2019 in hexadecimal, which looks like this in binary. Then we have to do something a little weird. We spread those bits over some bytes. The bigger the code point number, the more bytes we have to use. A link to a table that explains how this works in the description. For a code point from this part of the table, we use three bytes, and they look like this. Then we fill in the bits for the apostrophe's code point. Those three bytes together mean curly apostrophe in UTF-8. Notice that the characters we use most, the unaccented Latin characters from ASCII, they only take up one byte each. But when we need the rest of Unicode, we can get at it using more bytes. That's what makes UTF-8 so useful. And notice that these three bytes all begin with a one. That's how we know they can't be ASCII characters, because ASCII characters all use seven bits, so their eighth bit is always zero. But in Latin 1, remember, when the eighth bit is one, that just means we use the second table. So if we get the wrong idea and think that the email was written in Latin 1 when it was really written in UTF-8, we'll look up those bytes in the Latin 1 table and we'll find, well, here's the first one, and here's the second one, and there's the last one. Look familiar? What's really surprising here, maybe more surprising than the fact that we read the apostrophe wrong, was that we read the rest of the characters correctly. Remember, ASCII is a 50-year-old standard. There have been hundreds of text encodings since ASCII, but most of them have held on to those first 128 characters just to keep everything compatible. It's just the rest of the characters that give us trouble. And remember how I said we're fixing that? Well, the fix is really just that everyone is finally moving to UTF-8. It's been a long time coming, but today it's the default text encoding in most applications, which means that soon, ITES will be nothing more than a relic of the past. Thanks for watching The Binary Tree, and thanks especially to Diana Moga for inspiring this episode. She left a comment in the last episode about binary asking, I'm wondering how binary leads to actual website visuals. What's the missing link between binary and all these applications with attractive graphics? Of course, a big part of that is images, but these days a lot of what makes websites pretty is written in HTML and CSS and JavaScript, which are all written in text. Character data is what drives most of the web, so these text encodings are super important. Thanks again, Diana. And if you've got a question you'd like answered on the binary tree, or you just want to say hi, leave a comment below. Subscribe and like if you want to see more, and I'll see you next time. It only uses two, one and zero, which, you know, is great and all, but 
You ever wonder why? I mean, why do computers care about binary and Good all? mail. Any new mail for me? What is your username and password, please? Oh, right. It's Pija and password... Uh, Live in la vida loca. Welcome to Good Mail.